my colleague, Professor Adam Bergasser, who I wanted to hear uh, speak since, since he got here back in uh, 2009, right? He came in 2009. Mm -hmm. Adam's also originally came and, and he was an undergrad, graduated in the class of 1996. So he's a Triton. Crowd. Thanks for aging uh, me. He, say that again? <laughs> Thanks for aging me. Yeah, that's right. Now you can calculate it. Um, he worked with uh, Gene Smith, the late Gene Smith, and also the late uh, Professor Sally Ride while he was an undergrad. And he's uh, really one of the most innovative, uh, well-rounded scholars that I know. He really uh, is, is a proud addition that we have here. So uh, one, one thing to note about Adam is he's teaching this, this year he's teaching uh, a new class in the spring called the Theater and Dance Department, Theater and Dance 131. Um, not 137. It's called Project Planetaria and explores scientific measurement with aesthetic interpretation, uh, tools to use and explore astronomical information and design, data and aesthetics to drive discovery, uh, and he's co-teaching it with theater arts and visual arts. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty ambitious project that he's embarked upon. And not, uh, not to leave it there, on this Friday, tomorrow night, Adam will be presenting um, his new investigations into an embodied language for physics at the Audacious Speculations in Art Entrepreneurism at Cal IT2, so that's tomorrow night. Uh, and it's going to feature artists and researchers such as, uh, such as Adam who transformed something from nothing. And Adam will be discussing investigations on to whether or not a mathematically functional uh, language based on gestures and movement can bridge the gap between concept and formalism. So, pretty exciting. As I said, he's a Renaissance man, and we're very, <laughs> very thankful to have him today. So thanks a lot. Thanks, sir. I think the translation is once you get tenure, you can do all sorts of crazy things. <laughs> um, so it's my pleasure to uh, be here and give a talk. Uh, this uh, is this I don't think I've actually given a talk to the whole physics department before, so this is, this is a wonderful uh, opportunity. Um, and I wanted to share uh, more of the pure research that I'm working on, uh, and that's a very recent uh, sort of step forward in our field, and it's the discovery of a brand new class, uh, very cool uh, stars, objects, we'll talk about the difference in just a bit. Uh, that extend down to room temperatures, and this is a class called Wide Works. So I'm going to be talking about not just uh, the why we want to discover them, uh, but also the process in which we found them, and how we've been able to study them through technology. Um, before I go on, I want to make sure I uh, note all the people that have been, uh, I've been collaborating with for many of the results I'll be talking about today. Uh, this is a, a very incomplete list, um, but I want to make sure I highlight the folks that have been working on the instrument that fire, and the title is actually an instrument that I'll talk about uh, later on in this talk. Uh, it's an instrument that's been installed out at the Magellan Telescopes, uh, and Rob Simcoe at MIT is the PI for that project. Uh, works on a completely different other realm of astronomy, uh, highest redshift uh, galaxies in the universe, uh, but it turns out uh, we, we need the same instrument, so it was a good partnership. Um, I'll uh, mention a lot of results from the Y Spitzer team uh, that have been finding these objects uh, and that we've been working together to follow them up. Uh, and then, of course, many of the contributions uh, from my group here at UCSD, the Cool Star Lab, uh, many of whom, uh, many contributions are coming from undergraduate students uh, who have been pretty successful in moving on to other places. And so we've had people come in from, from other countries and from MIT. We've had people going out to Stanford and UCLA for graduate school. Uh, it's been fun watching them come and go uh, and also contribute science in the process. Uh, so these are, this is a sort of a breakdown of uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I want to make sure I get enough sort of introduction on my field because it's not a humongous field of brown dwarf. Uh, astrophysics, so I want to make sure I cover the basics uh, on why this field is interesting, uh, and why we're interested in particular on finding these very cold uh, brown dwarfs that I'm going to talk about today that go down to room temperatures. Uh, I'll talk about uh, exactly the discoveries that have been made and what their implications are more generally uh, in terms of star formation, uh, the efficiency of star formation at different masses, the history of star formation over the age of the galaxy. Uh, these are things that are actually accessible uh, by looking at these very cool brown dwarfs. And then if I have some time, I'll talk a little bit about the future or sort of the next five to ten years uh, for these objects, uh, particularly as new instrumentation comes online. Uh, so uh, the, I'll start with just a basic definition, uh, so I make sure I'm on the same page. Uh, what we call a brown dwarf is sort of an intermediate object. Uh, it spans a mass range between the lowest mass stars uh, and the uh, sort of highest mass giant planets, things like Jupiter and exoplanets are being found around other stars. Uh, and it's really kind of a, a hybrid because it has properties of both of these objects. And so depending on your funding uh, cycle and who you're asking funds for, uh, you might call this a failed star in the sense that these are objects that don't use hydrogen in their cores. And I'll explain the physics behind that in just a bit. Uh, but you, you, know, you can also call these super Jupiters, particularly if you're applying for NASA funds. Um, 
because they turned out to have, uh, just with the basic physics, they have about the same size, they, have, uh, they go down to the same temperatures, uh, and they even overlap in mass uh, with some of the exoplanets that are being found around other stars today. And in fact, uh, this will lead into a, a kind of conundrum we're having right now in terms of terminology, where we actually make a separation between things that are brown dwarfs and things that are planets is not actually very clear anymore. It was very clear before we started finding all these things, and now it's not. Uh, now, uh, the whole story of this, of course, goes way back to understanding nuclear phys astrophysics and nuclear processes in general. Uh, this is just a figure uh, from Burger to Burger to Fowler and Foyle, sort of this uh, seminal text, uh, understanding nuclear astrophysics uh, and, and how stars uh, make uh, elements and, and, the, and the process of making these elements uh, fuel their uh, radiation from their surfaces. Uh, everything that I'll mostly be talking about happens in just this one step here, where you go from hydrogen to helium. Um, but of course, uh, this paper explored a whole uh, network of other nuclear reactions that happen, particularly over the process of stellar death. Now, this is what I would call what makes stars work. This is the main job of stars, is converting hydrogen into helium, and in the process taking that energy uh, and, and sending it out into the universe uh, in terms of light from the surface. Uh, but you need to have a certain critical temperature in the core, or else everyone would get on the bandwagon and start freezing uh, as well. And so this is another plot from that same uh, paper, which is showing the energy generation rate for mass uh, for the proton-proton chain, uh, for the CNO cycle, and for a modified CNO cycle. Uh, and you can see that all of these uh, curves, the energy generation rates, drop off dramatically. Right? This is a this is a order of magnitude scale, or, uh, log scale. So they drop off very dramatically uh, somewhere around 3 million degrees. And so for any of these processes that uh, this paper talks about, uh, you have to at least have a temperature uh, of 3 million degrees at the core uh, for fusion to occur. Uh, now, how does a star get hot enough to start fusing uh, these elements? Uh, we have to go back to understanding how stars emerge in the first place. These are the stellar nurseries of stars. This is a picture of the Eagle Nebula, a very famous picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, in fact, this came out when I was an undergraduate, uh, and it was just uh, astounding. Everyone was amazed at how much detail you could see in terms of star forming environments. Uh, these are giant molecular clouds. They're mostly made out of uh, dust and molecular gas. They're very cold, about 10 Kelvin, and they're very large. This scale is something like seven or eight uh, light years in length. And the entire nebula actually covers an area of sky that's much, much larger than this. This is just one small piece of that nebula. Uh, and so the process of star formation is really a process of going from these diffuse clouds uh, that reside throughout the galaxy uh, into something that actually looks like a star. And just in cartoon form, this is sort of this process. You start with these big clouds. Uh, you have regions that become gravitationally unstable, right? They just have enough mass to overcome thermal pressure. They start to collapse. Right, that collapse in our perfect cartoon world is, of course, spherical. Uh, and then uh, you start to break out some of that gas shell as, uh, as, as the uh, star heats up enough, produces these jets that break out some of that material. Uh, you really start to clear it out over the course of about 10,000 to 100,000 years. And eventually, over time, all that remaining dust and gas uh, that didn't fall into the star, uh, mostly because of conservation of angular momentum, uh, ends up into planets that orbit this, uh, the star at the end. Now, it's a very powerful cartoon picture because, in fact, we now have images of every single one of these stages when we look out into the universe. And so here's that Eagle Nebula right here. This is the tip of one of those clouds. That's about the scale uh, for a giant molecular cloud that will form a solar mass star. Uh, here is a collapsed cloud, which is what we call propylids or tadpoles, depending on what your, what your I guess, biological preference is. Uh, here is one of these disks that's being eroded away by the jets that are being produced uh, from these newly formed stars. And over time, these disks get thinner and thinner. Now we see a reflected light. And eventually, you have a system like this. This is HR 8799, a uh, direct image of an exoplanetary system uh, that's actually taken from the Keck telescope. And so this is, a, this is sort of the standard model of star to planet formation. Uh, and it seems to apply uh, over a broad range of masses. And so the question is, of course, how low mass uh, can you go? Well, another thing to remember is that if, if the heat for producing nuclear reactions in these stars uh, comes from this gravitational collapse, how much do you have to collapse the star before you actually ignite these fusion reactions? Uh, and there's just a very simple scaling relation you can, you can look at. If you just take the energy uh, you require for ignition and assume that's a constant temperature, something like 3 million degrees or more, uh, and just equate it to the gravitational potential energy of a particle coming in uh, to the final radius of the star, then you get a nice relation where the mass of a star that's ignited fusion, that's actually actively fusing hydrogen, uh, is proportional to its size. And this explains, at least very qualitatively, uh, the very well-known mass-radius relationship for stars. The fact that very massive stars are very large, 
is in part because they don't have to get any smaller because they've already started doing the things that stars do, which is producing energy through fusion. As you go down to less and less mass, uh, you get to smaller and smaller stars until you get to these little dinky stars I call M dwarfs. They're about a tenth of the mass of the sun and about a tenth of the radius of the sun. So it's a, it's a fairly close scaling relation. And so, uh, so you could ask, you know, just for the heck of it, well, if I can make a, a star that's a tenth of a solar mass, can I make a star that's a hundred of a solar mass or a thousandth of a solar mass? Can I take this clicker and shrink it down to the size where I've extracted all the gravitational potential energy and started fusing hydrogen inside this little collapsed clicker? And of course, if you do the sort of scaling estimate from this, you realize it doesn't make any sense at all because you'd have to shrink this down to about one ten millionth the size of the nucleus before you can start fusing hydrogen. Which is not going to work. So there must be a minimum mass I would for a star. Uh, I, uh, I would have you do it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I would run away because I've got to make the fusion clicker. Yes? So, um, I'm not following up on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know this thing is huge. It would be bigger so you communicate that the smaller stars are better. Yes. Bigger stars? Yes. Uh, if I understand your scaling relation, the right hand side of that equality is constant, the same all regards to constant, then the temperature should be equal regards of the size of the star. What's going on? So this is the temperature in the core. This is the temperature you need at the, the center of the star in order to use hydrogen. The outer layer of the atmosphere doesn't have to collapse as far as far. And so you're not releasing as much gravitational potential. That outer temperature is based more on how much power is released from the nuclear reaction than and the temperature you need at the core. And also how much opacity is that in the center of the star. Okay, so so it's a perfectly valid question of how small I can push this down, uh, but there must be a limit. And that limit was explored back in the 1960s uh, by Shiv Kumar uh, and Hayashi Nakano, um, who uh, basically just said, let's let's take increasingly smaller and smaller stars uh, and evolve them through time, let them gravitationally collapse, and see at what point will they start to fuse hydrogen. Uh, and so this is a, a plot of, of core temperature versus density uh, from Xi's 1963 paper. And these lines are just showing uh, the, the trajectories of stars of different masses uh, as they get uh, smaller and, and heat up in the core. And uh, for hot stars, that's fine. You can breach this uh, sort of threshold limit for hydrogen fusion uh, uh, at, at some compact size. Uh, but of course, there's also this other limit you have to worry about, and that's a degeneracy limit for electrons uh, in these stars. Right? At some point, you pack this material so tightly that the electrons themselves can no longer shrink any further because they are supported by the, this electron degeneracy C. All, right? all the lower energy uh, states of these electrons inside the core are now filled up. And this is enough to now start, stop uh, or halt the collapse of these stars, provide another pressure support against gravity. And as a result, if you hit that point before you've actually gotten 3 million degrees, you in fact never get to that high temperature because you simply cannot extract any more gravitational energy from collapse. So uh, we don't have to worry about shrinking this down. Right? We can actually get down to that limit at much higher masses. It turns out that limit is something like 7% of the solar mass. And because these things are not producing energy through nuclear fusion, because they're not doing the things that stars do, uh, they don't evolve in the same way that stars do. And so this is uh, now an evolutionary plot of time uh, of the effective temperature, the sort of outer temperature of the stars uh, on a logarithmic scale. And all of these lines, are, again, are of different masses. A normal star all right, will collapse down to the point where it is starting uh, nuclear fusion in its core. <coughs> that energy production is very well balanced to the energy rate uh, that's being emitted from the surface. In fact, uh, there's a negative feedback mechanism, and so the star actually stays quite stable. It's in hydrostatic and thermal equilibrium for an incredibly long amount of time. So these stars that are about a tenth of solar mass can outlast uh, our universe many times over. Uh, but a brown dwarf, because it doesn't have an energy source, will reach a hydrostatic equilibrium because it is being supported by the generosity pressure. Uh, but it's not in thermal equilibrium. It just radiates its heat away. And so over time, these things cool down uh, from temperatures that are around 3,000 Kelvin at the surface, which is a very red star, uh, down to even colder temperatures, down to thousands and even to hundreds of degrees Kelvin if you wait long enough. And so this is a consequence of the inability to fuse hydrogen. That these stars are not the type where we can just look at it and say, okay, I know this is this temperature, which means it has to be this mass, which means it has this radius, which means it has to be this age. These things change with time. And so just, for example, measuring the temperature of a given object 
won't tell you whether it's a very young, very low mass object or very old uh, and, and very high mass and still around one. Now, this also sets another sort of, uh, um, sort of mass cutoff, which is a little more qualitative, and that's the difference between planets and ground dwarfs. And I put this in quotes uh, because this is not something that's actually universally agreed upon. Uh, but hydrogen fusion stops at about 0.075 solar masses. It can go up a little bit higher if you have a metal core star, but that's uh, sort of the sort of range for a regular solar metallicity star. If you go below about 13 solar masses, uh, the core never gets hot enough to fuse anything, even deuterium. And so uh, one of the definitions that have been proposed to separate these objects from planets is that planets are things that never fuse anything. And as I'll show in a little bit, that sort of contradicts with other definitions of planets. Okay, but the basic idea is that these things cool over time, they evolve over time. And they can cool to very, very low temperatures. All right, this scale goes down to 400 Kelvin. So that's a wonderful, nice, cute little theory. Who cares? Why should we care about these dimming stars? Well, one reason to care about them is if they are made of matter, right? That they are massive, uh, and they are cool so much that they are literally dark. They sound like great candidates for dark matter. And in fact, in the 1970s, uh, this was a, a big motivating factor for building uh, the ground dwarf field. If there were enough of these objects out in the universe uh, and you couldn't see them because they're just so cold, then you could potentially make up this missing matter uh, in our galaxy and other galaxies. And the reason for this is not so crazy. If we just take a nice picture of the sky uh, in sort of visible band wavelengths, what we notice that most of the stars, particularly when we look very deep in the sky, are these very cool red stars, these very, very low mass stars. Uh, in fact, these M dwarfs, the lowest mass of those stars, make up about 70 to 75 percent of all of the stars in the galaxy. So it's popular to be small in our galaxy. And this was known even back in the 1950s when Salpeter first studied this mass function or distribution of masses of stars. Uh, and this is the plot that he came up with. So this is in sort of a reverse order. The uh, lowest mass stars here on the right side. Uh, this is a 10 solar mass star, so here's the sun. And if you just count uh, the sort of uh, number uh, distribution of, of stars or the uh, number density of stars as a function of mass, uh, in 1955, that relation just kept going up and up as you go to the lower and lower with no end in sight. So it doesn't take much of an imagination then to extrapolate this relation out uh, as far as you'd like. So let's take it all the way down to an object that we know exists, which is Jupiter, uh, down to Jupiter mass. If you do that, what you find out is uh, that extrapolated relation will give you something like 300 brown dwarfs for every star in the galaxy. And the mass, the cumulative mass from all those objects, is about four times as, mass, as, ma as massive as the stars. And within a factor of two, that's about what you need for dark matter. And so there was a lot of interest and excitement to find these objects, because if you could find them, you would solve one of these big problems uh, in astrophysics. Now, if that was the case, that wouldn't still be one of the big problems in astrophysics today. Uh, so that certainly has not happened. In fact, it took 30 years uh, from the first uh, proposal that brown dwarfs would exist theoretically until the first detection uh, back in 1995, again, actually, when I was an undergraduate. Uh, this is an image of that first brown dwarf. Uh, this is Lisa 229b, which is a companion to this star, which is Lisa 229a. Uh, looks like a super humongous star on the screen, but in fact, this is one of those very, very low mass stars uh, that's very common out in our galaxy. Uh, and this one is much, much bigger than that. Uh, incidentally, uh, so this was discovered by uh, Ben Oppenheimer, who was at Caltech at the time. He's now a, a curator at the American Museum of Natural History. And this image is up at the American Museum of Natural History in the Rose Center. If you ever visit there, you'll see the one sort of striking piece of art of the groundwork of science. So how do you discover these if you cannot see them? Uh, good question. So you can see them, just not in the visible bands. And so it took the development of infrared detector technology, which was really sort of stimulated in the 1980s, uh, to make this image. So this image was taken by the Palomar uh, coronagraph, which is infrared uh, coronagraph. I should say, this, this image is from Hubble Space Telescope. Now, so uh, how do we know this thing is one of these missing, very little, runty uh, stars? Well, when you take a spectrum of that object, again, in the infrared, so this is now between about 1.5 and 1.7 microns, uh, this line is the spectrum of Lisa 229b. This line is the spectrum of Titan, the moon of Saturn. This not a normal stellar spectrum. Uh, and the reason it doesn't look normal is that this object's atmosphere is so cool uh, that it's actually the opacity in the atmosphere is dominated by molecules, in particular uh, the molecule of methane, which forms this very strong absorption feature out here in the near infrared. 
So the atmospheres look similar just because they have the same chemicals. Uh, and methane is not something you can see in stars that are thousands of degrees Kelvin. It immediately breaks down to carbon monoxide and other atomic gases. So the fact that methane is stable in the atmosphere of this object immediately told us that it was much too cold to be a star uh, and that it had to be something that was lower mass uh, than that, that threshold. Now, whether or not this is a planet or a brown dwarf has been a debate for some time, but uh, we know at least it's not a star. Uh, so that was first discovery in 1995. Uh, pretty shortly after that, there were a number of infrared stack surveys. Again, uh, the reason we can detect these things is because we're looking out at the modern wavelengths where they emit more light. The shift on um, the yeah. x axis doesn't matter. I mean, there is a shift in the, in the infrared. So, why? This right here? Oh, yeah. Then, yeah. Uh, so part of it is uh, and there's this a difference is in the there's a difference of low low difference low range here yeah yeah so it's the same or not the same so it's it's not the same because it's not a moon uh, it's a little bit different because uh, this is this is all still methane but this object's about a thousand kelvin this object's about ninety kelvin and so the very high uh, high uh, angular uh, rotation of, uh, trans uh, transitions that happen at Sort of long uh, departures from the molecular bands are missing in Titan, but they are present in the distant planet. So the same molecule, it's just it's just hotter, and so more of these sort of uh, high molecular bands are excited. Don't get this problem. Since you have this curve, and what is the curve? So uh, you can fit. So this I'm only showing a piece of the spectrum. There we have a spectrum that goes out from the optical out to the emitted thread, and you can fit that to various models, and you can figure out what the potential is based on those models. You can also measure the luminosity of the source and make an assumption about its radius and you get the Those are great. So within you know an order of maybe 100 to 200 Kelvin, this is about a thousand Kelvin. You're talking about the temperature at the surface or in the deep interior or so this is uh, at the photosphere, which is sort of where the optical depth uh, goes to the two thirds and you start making the photosphere. So. And at the center, what's the temperature? So we don't we can't measure it, but it certainly has to be less than three million. Um, I, I, I don't know the exact number. Um, I don't know what goes through the model for that. It's probably an order of a million degrees or less. That's definitely not three or not. Okay. Yeah. No, I just want to understand the difference. So in Jupiter, the, the temperature in the interior is much less. It's hundreds of thousands of thousands. But Jupiter is only one, one Jupiter mass, right? Um, this thing is probably something like 40 or 50 Jupiter masses, and so it's had a lot more energy potential than that. Okay, okay so uh, several surveys have now uh, come online, uh, again, sort of around the turn of the century, which I just heard recently as a term, which is amazing. Um, the two micron survey, which it, it was completely in the near infrared and observed the entire sky at wavelengths where these objects are bright. Uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is <coughs> Primarily an optical survey, but it had several very red, uh, close to infrared bands and was able to also detect some sources. And so today we have something like a thousand or more of these very cool ground dwarfs uh, that are known. So you know, only in 10 years have we had uh, that many uh, discovered. Uh, this is just a compilation uh, that's maintained by a colleague of mine. Um, now, you would think, well, if we have that many, uh, we should be able to really start to say something about uh, how much dark matter is made out of ground dwarfs. Um, and it turns out not. Not even close. And so, uh, if, you know, this is sort of, sort of schematic, but we sort of extrapolate the number of nearby round dwarfs uh, here in the solar neighborhood because we actually can't see one that's very far away from the solar uh, And we compare it to the sort of stellar density, the number of round dwarfs is closer to something like two tenths uh, to a half uh, compared to the number of stars. We needed something like 300 in order to make up dark matter. So we're orders of magnitude off in terms of having dark matter round dwarfs. Yeah. So there's an assumption that the local concentration of brown dwarfs is somewhat typical? Yes, yeah, so that's a big assumption. Even though um, dark matter is thought to be more concentrated around the edge of the galaxy rather than the middle. Right, so I'm only comparing brown dwarfs to stars. And so uh, this brown dwarf distribution is probably not too different than the stellar distribution. Uh, and so if locally the brown dwarf to star ratio is very low, it's unlikely that we would suddenly find a halo of However, I will get back to this in a moment, but I think we'll think of maybe that. So the assumption is the efficiency which you can actually find it. Yeah, so there's a lot of corrections in terms of 
you know, we only see certain types out to 10 light years and then maybe five light years. There are many selection effects in terms of, of uh, you know, whether this thing is unusually colored or binary. So all those things have to be accounted for when we track these numbers. So this is very just a rough order number. But this number is known much better in clusters, young clusters, where you know where all the stars are. Yeah, they say that the, as, as the time goes on, you discover more and more the future. I'll come back to that. <laughs> no, that's actually it's a it's a it's a very valid point. I'll come back to that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what do we do? It's not dark matter. So uh, what do we do with them? Well, it's a very it's a, it's a it's a completely new population. I mean, even if it's not three hundred times as the number of stars, it's a population that's significant in number. Right? If there if there's half as many of these objects as there are stars, then there should be a lot of brown dwarfs very nearby the sun. Uh, and so it's, it's an interesting population study. So what's the first thing we do when we find a population? Well, we follow the biologist lead, and we start to classify these objects. Uh, and when we classify them, uh, we classify them based on their spectral properties. Uh, but this is sort of just a quantitative description of what the, the physical aspects of these objects are. Uh, this is what we actually use to classify these objects. These are the spectra brown dwarfs. These are actual data. Uh, and uh, this is now spanning sort of the red optical range. So our, we can see somewhere around here. And then we can't see past this, and that's where all our data is. Um, these are three different types, uh, sorry, four different types of objects. The top one here is uh, an M type dwarf. These would represent the hottest uh, brown dwarfs that haven't had time to cool off. They still have all of their gravitational contraction heat, and so they're about 3,000 Kelvin at their surface. Um, as they cool off, you start to see a lot more structure in their spectrum. This is not a noisy spectrum, this is actually an incredibly high signal noise spectrum. All that fine feature is all of the molecular bands that are present uh, as these atmospheres get cooler and cooler. Uh, eventually, methane kicks in, that methane that I showed for Gleason 2 to 9b. That starts to really cut away the spectrum. And so what used to look like a, at least pretty close to a black body distribution looks nothing like a black body distribution when you get down these temperatures. And just for comparison, here's Jupiter. right? Here's Jupiter, and here's that sort of coolest class of brown dwarfs. Uh, at least morphologically, they're fairly, fairly similar. There are important differences. Uh, but that morphological similarity is because, again, some of the same uh, chemicals are in the atmospheres of both of these things. And so this points to one of the, one of the reasons we're interested in these very low temperature brown dwarfs, is that they do have atmospheres that, at least in composition and temperature, are very similar to exoplanets. And there's a lot of effort today to directly detect and find and measure and study exoplanets. We don't actually have to work that hard because these things are just floating around by themselves. We don't have to block out a bright star next to them. We can actually study the, the atmosphere of physics, the atmosphere of dynamics of these objects in great detail. Now, uh, if I map these classifications back onto this evolutionary diagram, again, temperature versus time, uh, these classes sort of map onto these temperature ranges. And one thing you can start to see is that if I follow one of these trajectories, these mass lines for a brown dwarf, the evolution of an object really spans different spectral types. It's not just an M dwarf. It's not just an L dwarf, it changes over time. And I'll just historically, this is the reason that these objects are called brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs is a terrible name if you want to sort of sell your science. Uh, it's not an exciting color, not purple, right? not pink. Uh, the reason they're brown is because when they first did the models for these, they, they didn't know A, what the colors would necessarily be because the opacities are so uh, complex in these atmospheres. And also, they would be many colors as they changed. So instead of taking one color, they sort of picked a color that was sort of like all colors, and that's that's how brown dwarfs were born. Yeah. Dwarf, dwarf is a yeah. That's the other reason this is a terrible term. It's, it's sort of offensive on many levels. Uh, I'm personally very offended by dwarf dwarfs, but that's okay. Uh, anyway, so so this sequence M dwarf, L dwarf, T dwarf, and whatever's after that is really an evolutionary sequence for these objects. Uh, and, uh, and that's that's going to come into play in just a little bit. Okay, so uh, so what else is what are the outstanding questions about brown dwarfs today? Uh, one thing is we know they exist, but we're not entirely sure how they form. Uh, it turns out it's very hard to form these brown dwarfs from that sort of standard picture of star formation I showed earlier. Uh, the reason is is that that collapse of that cloud uh, requires having enough mass to overcome the thermal pressure, and it's about ten Kelvin in its hot. But of course, if you had less mass to start with, you had less gravitational potential, so it was very hard to pull these things together. So the, the genes mass, the mass that you can actually collapse in a cloud, actually scales inversely with the density. 
And so uh, in order to have a brown dwarf, you need to have a very, very dense region in your cloud. And of course, if you have a very dense region in the cloud, how do you stop all the rest of the stuff from following in on the collapse and still make your stuff so much bigger? Turns out that follow-up accretion is one of the main uh, contributors to the final mass of the star. So you start in a very dense region, how do you stop all that stuff coming in? So there's a bunch of theories on how we might do this. Uh, there are questions whether the formation of brown dwarfs might actually be influenced by things that are in the environment. For example, a very hot star in that area. Will that ablate enough the material away so you can make these little uh, nuggets of stars? Um, and also whether there's a, a metallicity dependence on, on this formation process as well. Now, I don't uh, work on the theories here. Uh, Alexi uh, Prinsip uh, has worked on this quite a bit uh, here at UCSD and Palo Alto before him. Um, I'm still doing that. Um, one of the ways that I approach this problem is actually look at the systemic properties of these objects because if you can form brown dwarfs, you can also form brown dwarf systems. And we do see brown dwarf systems out there as well. And so my approach is actually studying the multiplicity statistics in order to constrain some of the predictions of these formation models. Uh, and this is work that's being done by uh, several members of, of our group, uh, and, and particularly looking at techniques where we combine high resolution imaging, uh, so using adaptive optics imaging to get very, very uh, tight uh, images of tight binaries, and combining that with spectroscopy. Uh, this is a, just sort of a, a spectral movie at high resolution. This scale here is something about a half an arc second on the side. Uh, and you can see that this little little nugget comes out here uh, briefly. This is scaling through uh, spectrum. The reason it's only coming out at certain points is that other wavelengths, its length is completely obscured by its net absorption. And so we can actually detect some of these very cool things based on where, they're, where they actually appear uh, in different wavelengths. We've also developed this new technique uh, of identifying uh, binaries that are called spectral binaries that are blend, blended spectrum. Uh, this is an example of one of those where uh, the black line is the observed spectrum, and then the green line is a sum of two other templates. And the only way to make up that black line is to assume that you have two spectra that are contributing to that one spectrum. So we can't actually resolve that system. You can't separate it into two points of light. But we know it's a binary, and we even know what the properties of those, at those atmospheres are. And so this has been a way of actually getting to very, very close separation. This is work that Danielle is doing right now. Um, Another important question is understanding the interior states uh, of these, these objects. Right? They're dig partially degenerate objects. Uh, they are uh, composed of uh, sort of semi-degenerate, strongly interacting plasma. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at the predictions from current theories of the radius versus mass relation, which is dependent entirely on the, the, the equation of state inside the stars, uh, this brown dwarf mass regime uh, occupies a very interesting minimum uh, in this relationship. And so being able to actually make measurements in this regime is very important for understanding the basic physics of these equation of state of these degenerate objects. And so what is that equation of state? How reliable is this theory? Uh, and also, how does the interior plasma state uh, affect things like magnetic fields or the evolution of the rotation of the object? Uh, that's something that we are approaching directly uh, by measuring the magnetic fields uh, with radio observations. So this is work by Carl Mellis. Uh, and also Christine Nichols, who is measuring the rotation rates of some of these things using high resolution spectroscopy. Uh, we're looking for signatures of strong magnetic fields, uh, either in the optical or here, where this is a radio detection of a brown dwarf. No one ever expected actually to see these things in the radio because they shouldn't be magnetically active. They're too cool and they're too fully convective. And yet we do find that, in fact, they are very magnetically active. And more importantly, it looks like the oldest of these brown dwarfs are the most active objects, which is completely the opposite of what we see in stars. So there's something very fundamentally different about how these magnetic fields So for the radio observations, we basically assume um, we can measure the spectral energy distribution. So we look at where the sort of that, that starts to peel off, and so that peels off somewhere around the plasma frequency. And so we use that as one constraint of the magnetic field. And that constrains the emission sort of at the sort of outer part of the then we have to make some assumptions about what the surface is. Like. So it's much, much stronger than Jupiter. Um, if we look at uh, low mass stars, N type stars, those are about kilogauss fields at their fields, at their surfaces, photospheres. And it looks like these things are about the same, somewhere around kilogauss fields. They're very strong. And uh, you know, related to that is they're also very rapidly rotating. And that's probably part of the reason why they're so strong. We don't quite understand why. They are so rapidly rotating. These things rotate around every four days, or four, sorry, every four hours. Or Jupiter rotates every ten hours. And we think that's very rapid. We were going to question that. 
Okay, and uh, the last thing is uh, understanding their atmospheres, in particular the chemistry in their atmospheres. Uh, I didn't mention this in detail, but uh, that one sort of middle class of brown dwarfs, the L dwarfs, uh, are at just the right temperature, uh, where some of these gas species not only start to form molecules, but they actually condense out into solids and liquids. Uh, and these are actually mineral species. So if you think about it, you know, we can, we can start to melt things like rocks and metals around 2,000 Kelvin. Well, these objects have atmospheres at about 2,000 Kelvin. So they're going through the reverse process. They're actually freezing out to the minerals. And that results in, in literally uh, weather on these objects. And we're starting to see some evidence of that weather, uh, both through the direct detection um, of some of the, the grain features, uh, particularly the silica grain features. This is some work I did back in 2008 looking at mid-infrared spectra and finding these very strong mineral features in these objects. But we also see variability uh, that gives us, a, for example, a measurement of this rotation period. We see variations that are on scale between one and eight hours in these objects. And we believe that that variability is probably has to do with how these clouds are distributed on the surface. And so this is sort of opens up a brand new window for planetary atmosphere dynamics, because these are not 100 Kelvin Jupiter atmospheres, these are 2,000 Kelvin 60 Jupiter mass atmospheres. And there's a lot of different sort of scaling uh, relations that happen uh, when we get to those hot objects. So this is some work that's been done by a couple of students here at UCSD as well. Okay, so I'm going to transition now to talking a little bit more about the very cold brown dwarfs and why we're particularly interested uh, in those objects. <coughs> um, uh, first of all, uh, when I define cold, what I really mean are things that are uh, below about 500 Kelvin. This is about the limit of uh, the temperature of objects that we have found uh, prior to about 2000, 2009, 2010, with those sort of earlier verified surveys. Uh, so there's 500 Kelvin, right? That's sort of the end of my thesis. And here's Jupiter. And there's about 300, 400 Kelvin in, in sort of temperature space that hasn't been explored. Now, that doesn't seem very much, but a lot can happen uh, in this sort of range of temperature space. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of chemistry that happens. Uh, I talked about mineral cloud formation, but in this range, you start to get ices that form uh, in these atmospheres. And there's a lot more mass in ice than there is in rock. Right? This is why the planets in the outer solar system are so big. There were a lot more icy big things that build those planets with than there were uh, rocks that build those little planets with Earth. Right? So those will have a significant effect in terms of the atmospheric properties of chemistry. Uh, as I mentioned, they, we know they have uh, clouds and we know they have patterns in their clouds, so that suggests there's some dynamics and understanding those dynamics something that planetary, astronomy, planetary scientists are interested in. Uh, and also, when you combine these things, you start to get very interesting chemical cycles, uh, which is important for understanding equilibrium and non-equilibrium. Uh, now, not only that, is that this range of temperatures turns out to be a very interesting range for the exoplanet hunters. Uh, in the next uh, five to 10 years, uh, there are going to be several instruments coming online that you know, people have spent literally hundreds of millions of dollars on to directly take images and spectra of planets around other stars. Uh, and so here are sort of uh, three of these instruments. Gemini G Pi is actually going to be out in the next year. Uh, and it'll be able to reach in uh, somewhere around sort of 200 million arc seconds, so about 200, 2 AU from a solar type star in parsecs. Uh, and that's sort of the temperature range uh, that we reach if you just had a planet in equilibrium at that distance. Right? That's a temperature we've never seen before in terms of atmospheres. Uh, VLT and TMT are going to start to probe even closer to the stars. And this entire range is the range in which we have no data. No observations, no atmospheres that we've actually seen uh, at those temperatures. And so, uh, and I should also mention, of course, that this range also encompasses the habitable zone for solar type planets. And so, if you're in particular interested in looking for uh, whatever the name of that moon uh, that Pandora creatures were living on, uh, they live right there. Right? <laughs> on a moon around a giant planet that's right there. Right? So, uh, again, understanding what those planets look like will help us find the signposts for those planets. And we'll actually be able to say something about. Uh, whether we're finding planets or not. Uh, and already, uh, people, of course, are looking at direct images of planets. I showed that a little bit earlier, this HR8799 system. Uh, there's now been some studies of their uh, spectral properties of the atmospheres. And in fact, when you compare the data, these are the black points that have been measured, uh, to, to actual spectra of brown dwarfs. Right? So these are examples of three different types of brown dwarfs. Uh, those data actually turn out to line up not too uh, terribly with, with brown dwarf spectra. And so, again, studying brown dwarfs gives us a little bit of a heads up on how we might expect exoplanet spectra to look like because they're at the same temperatures, they have the same compositions, and so at least the chemistry at some level should be very similar. But they're much easier to study. Right? We don't have to worry about blocking out a really bright star. We don't have to build a hundred million dollar instrument and just point a telescope at it and study it. 
A third reason why these very cold things would be very interesting to find and count up is, uh, is actually getting back to your question. If ground dwarfs form and they cool over time, then all the ground dwarfs that formed very early on in, in, in the galaxy's history will have cooled down to these very cold temperatures. Uh, and so if you really want to understand the mass function and the formation rate of these objects over time, you really have to look down at these very cool objects because that's where the history is. Right. So this is a, a couple of simulations I ran uh, for the Kale survey a couple years ago, uh, comparing different uh, forms of the mass function, again, the number of stars as a function of mass, uh, and then comparing points where you might have a minimum star formation mass. Maybe you can't form things less than 20 Jupiter masses or 10 Jupiter masses or 5 Jupiter masses. That will have direct consequences on the number of these very cold ground dwarfs you'd expect to find. And so if you want to constrain those parameters of star formation, this is where all the action is. Uh, okay, so this is a simulation of this. Uh, this is uh, showing with time, so we're starting out at very early times, constant star formation in the galaxy, and this range of masses with sort of a normal mass function, and you can, oop, no, you can't watch it, sorry. Okay, sorry, never mind, I can't play it. Trust me, you'll get a lot of white words. <laughs> okay. Uh, and it's finally, uh, we, uh, and getting back to this, the, the atmospheres, uh, again, our planetary colleagues are very interested in this because there's a lot of interesting chemistry that ha happens in this temperature. Uh, this is just a pressure temperature, uh, pressure, uh, sorry, pressure temperature plot for various species. And here's that 500 Kelvin limit. This is about the pressure range of the photospheres around the the regions where we actually measure their spectrum. And there's a number of very interesting transitions that we go through. First of all, ammonia uh, starts to form in these atmospheres. We should expect to see that uh, in abundance. Uh, we start to see the condensation, as I mentioned, of salts. Uh, right, salts like potassium chloride, cesium chloride, very unusual types of salts. Those will actually have an effect on the atmosphere. And we're actually starting to see that effect uh, today. Uh, this is just a set of models showing what happens if you have, for example, sodium sulfide clouds that form these atmospheres. They dramatically change uh, what the near infrared properties of these objects look like. And we've actually now started to see that in some of the sources that we're studying that are very close to this 500 Kelvin uh, threshold. Um, this is a system that's been discovered uh, about two or three years ago, and we took a couple of spectra of it, and what we found is that models that have clouds are much better producing uh, the spectra than models that don't have clouds. And that actually tells us that a new set of clouds is coming in. These are not mineral clouds that we found in Eldors. These are clouds made out of ices and sulfides. A new set of uh, uh, atmospheric chemistry that's happening. And by the way, this is also a seven Jupiter mass object around a star. Planet, I don't know. Uh, and then finally, we hope to at some point to detect the condensation of water ice, which is going to be the most abundant solid species in the atmosphere and should dramatically change the spectrum of these objects. I'll also mention that Jupiter at some point went through this phase as well. It's a cool thing. And we're not quite sure what effect that had uh, on the evolution of the, the chemical species uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, we would also expect to see something like this in exoplanets as well. All right, so how do we discover these things? Well, um, here's a set of spectral models, uh, just to sort of put this in, in perspective. Uh, this is the, uh, the flux density at 10 parsecs in sort of units that astronomers like to use uh, as a function of wavelength here, the in near infrared and mid infrared. Most of the work that's been done has been in this region, and I've highlighted different temperatures, but this sort of 400 Kelvin that we're aiming for down in red. Most of the work has been done for has been done here, and that's pretty hopeless when you get down to wide dwarfs because there's essentially very little flux and the deep flux. What you really like to do is start to observe objects in this sweet spot at five microns, which is a both a minimum in the gas opacity, and it's also just the getting close to the peak of the black body uh, black body function. So those earlier surveys were over here, had no chance of finding wide dwarfs. The next generation near infrared surveys moved, uh, got deeper in that same region, <coughs> and were just able to barely catch maybe some nearby uh, wide dwarfs out in the red. And so, in the last couple of years, from those surveys, there have been a few tentative suggestions of wide dwarfs, things that people think that they might be wide dwarfs because they're slightly different in their spectral properties, uh, looking for evidence of ammonia uh, in the near infrared, for example. Uh, but these are very controversial because it's very hard to distinguish if that's ammonia or if that's just noise because it's also in the same region as really strong water absorption. So while these surveys had the uh, possibility of detecting this stuff, it wasn't really uh, secure. 
Moving out to this sweet spot uh, requires uh, different instrumentation. We can't actually move off the ground uh, to observe out here in five microns. And fortunately, we have this mid infrared sur instrument called the Spitzer Space, Space Telescope, which is able to observe these wavelengths. Uh, and my colleague uh, Kevin Lumen has been doing a survey for these objects, uh, looking around nearby stars to find companions that only show up at these mid infrared wavelengths. And uh, a couple years ago, uh, he managed to find one such object. Uh, this is an object called WD0806-661. It's a white dwarf, all right? And it has a brown dwarf companion right here that's moving with it. So these are two images taken about five years apart. All the rest of the stars are staying put, but these two objects, which are moving close to us in space, are moving together. That's how we know that they're in the same, uh, they're in the same bound system. Uh, now, that's, and so it turns out the brightness of this thing is so faint that we would expect it to be down in this very cool brown dwarf regime. The problem, of course, is following it up is very hard to do for the same reason why I said we can't use near infrared to find these things. All of the instruments we've tried to follow up this thing have been unable to detect it. This is the original Spitzer image, and then here's a pair of uh, near infrared images going down to basically as faint as we can go from the ground in near infrared, and we see nothing. It's an invisible star. It's not even invisible, it's an infraredible star. <laughs> And it's so faint that uh, the limits for how bright it is in terms of absolute magnitude uh, are actually orders of magnitude much fainter than the sort of ends of, of the known sources. These are L dwarfs and T dwarfs. This is sort of the famous objects that were known up until about a couple years ago. And this is the upper limit to how bright this object is. So it's a completely different, unusual object. Unfortunately, we can't say much about it because we can't actually detect it uh, beyond this sort of few wavelength range. Uh, so uh, fortunately, we now have another mid-infrared spacecraft that's been doing a survey. It's the Y survey, uh, launched uh, a few years ago. We completed this mission doing a full sky survey in infrared. In fact, we did a, a couple patches of the sky uh, in, over the course of a couple of years, and that will uh, be important a little bit later on. Why is there a factor? This is a real Good eye. Good eye. <laughs> uh, it was an aesthetic choice for where Wise was facing. A good eye. <laughs> Um, the reason why it's exciting for finding these cold ground dwarfs is that unlike those ground-based surveys, it's purposely surveying in the mid-infrared range where these objects are brighter. So here's that sweet spot, and there's a filter that sits right on that sweet spot. So it should be able to detect sources, uh, these very cold ground dwarfs, where they are brightest, designed specifically for that. Uh, going back to this sort of model plot, you can see that this is where WISE is detecting things, and it should have no problem detecting 400 Kelvin objects if they're 10 parsecs away, if they exist. And so, um, so that was the, the goal of, of searching uh, through WISE to find these objects. Uh, even after you find them, you have to actually understand whether they really are the objects you're looking for. And so fortuitously, at the same time, we commissioned this instrument called FIRE uh, at Magellan. It's an infrared spectrograph. Unfortunately, we can't do mid-infrared spectroscopy from the ground, but we can do very sensitive near-infrared spectroscopy. Uh, and uh, this is the instrument right here that's mounted on, on the side port of this telescope. Um, it's capitalizing on fairly new infrared detector technology. Um, this is a detector that's about this big. Uh, it's about 90% quantum efficiency in the infrared uh, and optical, uh, and it costs more than my house. Um, but it's been developed uh, particularly for JW JWST, and now those detectors are now starting to make it into the ground-based astronomy community uh, as they become cheap enough to incorporate into instrumentation. And so we put this into this device. Um, uh, here are some of the capabilities of the instrument. It has continual spectral coverage over the entire near infrared regime. Uh, we have two different modes where we can do sort of moderate resolution to do uh, radio velocity work. That's some of the work that Christina is doing right now. Uh, and then low resolution for really, really faint objects, these wide dwarfs that we're looking for. Uh, and, and like it, it was actually just commissioned about three years ago. We just hit the three year anniversary. Uh, it's been used to study all sorts of different astronomical objects. Um, but of course, mostly what I'm interested in is the brown dwarfs. And so here are some of those fire spectra. And there's wide dwarfs. Exciting. <laughs> so to the untrained eye, this doesn't look that impressive. All right, it looks like a bunch of other little curvy things that uh, uh, sometimes look like jaws teeth if you look at them close enough. Um, it's very hard to actually distinguish between, so this red line is the sort of coldest uh, uh, T-type dwarf that was known before this. And it's actually very hard to distinguish between these things and that red line. It turns out the spectra, as we go down to 300, 400 Kelvin, don't change very much. And we expected these very big changes to come uh, because of all these chemical transitions and what we're finding. 
is that the spectra are very, very similar. It's very hard to separate the class of, of, of these objects uh, from the things that we've already discovered. Um, but what makes them Y dwarfs is uh, actually kind of by fiat, right? We just, uh, the way spectral classification is done is you identify certain stars in the sky and you say that this star is the T6 standard. And every T6 I find has to look exactly like that one star. It's a very empirically based system, uh, and it's meant to be that way because we don't want to bias it through you know, sort of theoretical ideas that may change over time. That star will always be that star if we find it that way. And so uh, the WISE group has just found things that are full enough, and they've just decided that this object in particular is defines the wide dwarf class. And so anytime you find something that looks like it, that's a wide dwarf. Seems very <laughs> anticlimactic, right? Because uh, it's not like we found something amazingly different. But we can still compare these spectra to models, and what we do find is that they are, in fact, in this time frame of day that we were looking for. Uh, most of these objects, uh, when we fit them, uh, get temperatures that are something like 300 to 500 Kelvin. That's right in that cold ground. <coughs> so even though they don't look spectacularly different, they are sufficiently different uh, to indicate that they are these very cold objects uh, and, and the thing that we're looking for. Um, now it turns out that there is some unusual aspects of these objects. Uh, as we start to gather some of this data, this is, you know, most of these papers are going to be in the last year because uh, this, uh, these discoveries have just been made very recently. Um, this is been looking at uh, absolute magnitude versus color, and there's a huge amount of scatter when we make measurements of the, op the, the characteristics of the object. They don't follow a nice line like some of these other LMT dwarfs. They seem to span out into all sorts of different color spaces. And we think that the reason they fan out so much is that each of these four objects, so it's not a big sample, probably has a slightly different uh, cloud coverage on its surface. And because the clouds are so thick, it actually has a very common effect on the colors of these objects. And so the scatter suggests that clouds are coming in. Uh, again, these are ice clouds, not mineral clouds. These are ice clouds are coming in, and they're having a profound effect on the spectrum. Uh, now, the important thing, as I mentioned, for finding these objects was being able to use them to constrain the star formation history uh, and the mass sort of efficiency uh, for the cool ground dwarfs. Uh, these are now the first sort of uh, constraints on this. Uh, these are the same models that I showed earlier. Uh, from, uh, from the decadal survey, uh, and this purple line is sort of now the current running number of these objects, at least the current running density of objects that we find in this Y survey as a function of temperature. Uh, and importantly, uh, like I said, these are, upper, uh, these are lower limits, and so there may be more objects as we go up here, but we can actually start to rule out some, in, uh, some interesting parameter space for both the mass function and the star formation history. Uh, for example, we can definitely rule out this model that says that we have very, very few of these white dwarfs just because it's very hard to make low mass things. We can also rule out that there's a limit for star formation at 10 Jupiter masses because we see things that are much cooler and shouldn't be there if they were formed during the age of the galaxy. So that's actually a very important statement. It says that we can make stars, or there's, there are star-like things that are out in the universe, or at least the nearby galaxy, uh, that are below 13 Jupiter masses, which is below that sort of planetary mass definition I mentioned earlier. So there may be some overlap in these definitions that make it hard to actually separate what's a brown dwarf and a planet. Is that close to that for efficiency? Is it? Uh, the, yeah, so it, it counts. So it gets very hard in here because the very famous of these objects can only be found something like five parsecs away. So the volume that you can sample gets really small. And so the correction factors get really large, and so they sort of go quick. So this is this is a very conservative correction, and that's why there's upper limits on these. That is why they're all lower limits. Um, but uh, I think until all, all of this done, it has been built in much more careful judgment. Okay, so what's next uh, for these objects now that we've found them and we're starting to use them a little bit for uh, measuring uh, fundamental properties of star formation? Uh, we are increasing our demographics. Uh, uh, in the past year, we've sort of doubled the number of wide dwarfs that have been found. Most of the backup is just being able to detect and measure these objects because they're so intrinsically faint at all wavelengths except the mid-infrared. Uh, we don't have a mid-infrared spectrograph uh, in space currently, and so it's very hard to do any kind of uh, analysis of their atmospheres uh, here from the ground. And so its slope has been a little bit, fall, a little bit slow. Um, but as we, as we make more accurate measurements, we'll be able to firm up the constraints on these, uh, uh, the mass function, uh, minimum star formation mass, and also the uh, sort of star formation history uh, of, our, of our galaxy. Uh, 
Now, it's it's actually still an open problem. So this is like going back to your question about if you go fade it up, maybe we find a whole bunch of other things that change their numbers. Uh, there was a uh, paper that came out a couple years ago uh, from the Ogle Group claiming uh, to find a humongous population of very, very low mass objects, so 1 to 10 Jupiter mass kind of things uh, that are microlensing uh, background stars. Uh, and uh, if you count their sort of four or five detections in the paper and you extrapolate accordingly, uh, they would argue that there's something like uh, one to three and a half times as many of these objects in the, in the galaxy as there are uh, low mass stars. Or sorry, main sequence stars. So these would greatly outnumber the stars in our galaxy. Not enough to make up dark matter still, but still that would be a, a pretty tremendous population of objects. And there's been a lot of discussion in the literature where these things might come from. Uh, were they ejected planets? Does this suggest another formation mechanism for very low mass objects? Um, it turns out that all of these objects, because they're low mass, will almost all be these Y type R type dwarfs. They, don't, they haven't gathered enough gravitational attraction to keep the quark started, and so they will be very cool objects today. Uh, and so we can use the number counts from the Y dwarfs to actually constrain this uh, sort of tentative detection. Uh, right now, it looks like this is probably heavily overestimated because there would have to be a dramatic change in the, in the mass function of these objects uh, based on the numbers we detect today to account for that many very low mass uh, things for them. Um, we're uh, getting more interested in ice cloud formation. Uh, I didn't talk in great detail, but mineral clouds actually play quite a, pro a prominent role in shaping the Eldor spectra and causing variability in their uh, light curves. Uh, water ice clouds will be much denser and how much have a great, have a much greater effect so great of effect that, in fact, uh, uh, atmospheric models have been very hard to produce for things that have water clouds because it completely changes the at opacity of the atmosphere so fast that it's very hard to convert a pressure temperature profile uh, just from calculations. And so at some level, theory is not going to guide us in terms of what water, ice, cloud, dwarfs look like. We have to go and find them before we actually know. Uh, and then uh, recently there's been uh, uh, a sort of surprising uh, discussion on the possibility that these are uh, objects that could harbor a sizable population of habitable planets. And you would immediately think, well, that's ridiculous because round dwarfs change with time. Right? If it's habitable for today, it's not going to be habitable for tomorrow when round dwarf is playing time colder than it's right off. Well, it turns out that because the cooling rate slows down uh, very dramatically as they get colder and colder, uh, there's a phase in the evolution of a brown dwarf where it stays roughly the same temperature uh, for something like 5 billion years, which is more than enough time, at least here on Earth, to form complex life. And so if you can survive a very rough early phase when the star is 30 times brighter, uh, you could potentially be in a, a place where a, a planet could exist in the habitable zone. Now there's a lot of ifs and whats and how could that be that go on. A lot of things you have to worry about, like desiccation, all right, the fact that the atmosphere would probably completely dry out and all the water would, would escape. Uh, irradiation effects, tidal effects, these all may be problematic. But some of the models have convergence to, uh, to configurations where you could have a habitable planet around a brown dwarf and that would be stable long enough to actually potentially form life. All right? so that gets the exoplanet people very excited. And it turns out that this rate, er, uh, period where it's pseudo-stable, or at least not cooling very fast, is exactly the same uh, temperature range where we expect to find these wide dwarfs. So if there are a lot of wide dwarfs, there are potentially many, many planets uh, that could be habitable. Just very weird because they wouldn't see any light in the sky. Okay, so uh, this is my conclusions. Um, I just uh, I think probably the main point to, to take away from this is that we have found this class of very, very low temperature uh, round dwarfs. Uh, things that get down to 300 Kelvin are probably a little bit cooler. Uh, and they've mostly been found by many different surveys such as Spitzer and Wise. Uh, the coldest of these reached down again to about something like room temperature uh, and very, very faint magnitude, so faint that we're still struggling to follow them up. And so we hope that with uh, JWST, which it launched in 2018, we'll actually get to know a little bit more about the atmosphere. Uh, we're finding that there's a lot of interesting uh, chemistry in the atmospheres, things like salt clouds and sulfide clouds, and eventually you may find <coughs> water ice clouds in there. Uh, and that's very exciting for the planetary astronomers. Uh, but more importantly for the actual astronomer astronomers is that these are starting to provide some very interesting constraints on the limiting mass for star formation and the efficiency of star formation at very low masses.
Uh, and as we sort of build up those demographics, we'll actually be able to say something about whether uh, what's the lowest mass you can observe. And I will take your questions. Thank you very much. So these would be uh, the brown dwarfs themselves would not be habitable. These would be planets that are a thousandth of an AU from a brown dwarf. And that brown dwarf is just the right temperature and the planet's at just the right distance. So that planet is habitable. So it would be for the same distance for the same So it's an excellent question, right? So this is you know, this is where the astrobiologists go crazy because uh, you know you have most of the lights going out of the infrared. If you actually have an atmosphere that has water, you have the same problem we have trying to detect these things, is that all the lights are blocked out by the atmosphere. And so it may be a very dark place. You may end up having things that figure out some other form of photosynthesis. That would be very much you know, at a very low level, much, much lower level because it's very speculative. Yeah. Uh, Piedmont, that last question, uh, since you seem to have a history of cool. One of the reasons for the rise of life on Earth is because the sun's been so stable for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the thing. Like, it's the Kabash on that. Well, it's, I mean, the ancient thing is the star has not been, our star has not been stable. It's actually grown in luminosity since the beginning of our, of our solar system. The amazing thing is the Earth has not changed. Uh, even though the sun has actually gotten hotter in luminosity from the sun over the, over the five billion years that we've been. So, you know, this, I mean, this is actually, this is one of the, uh, so this is the thing on the sun paradox. Why, if we have a much bigger sun early on, is the Earth is the Earth sustainable for life to you know, have the blue line on the surface? Going all the way back before you know, 4.7 billion years ago, we have evidence of that. So our sun has changed in the place, but our Earth has not. So there are feedback effects in the atmosphere that may be important. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, so that, that's the fundamental problem in terms of ground reclamation theories and why there are multiple ground reclamation theories. Uh, if you did nothing, if you just had, you know, sort of the Frank Shue model of a, a large cloud that just collapses on, collapses on itself, then you could never form a ground board. In fact, you look at Frank's 1987 review paper, he predicts that no ground wars can be formed. He predicted that before ground wars. Um, so there's a number of mechanisms to sort of that have been proposed for this. One way, you know, these are not big spherical objects that are formed in isolation. Um, you know, I show this picture of what a molecular cloud looks like. Um, you know, that's not a sphere, right? And so you can have geometrical effects where you can only have accretion along the line as opposed to empirically. You also have dynamic effects, so dynamical effects. And so uh, you may form a, a proto ground war. And then something you come around and kick it out. Before it's like, uh, this is also a dynamical system in terms of gas. There are waves pushing through here. So you may have a, a compression wave that makes it look very worse, and a verification wave that removes all the material that would cause it to collapse further, further. So these are all different models for how these things are formed. So there's something like five or six different models. And so it's up to us observers to come up with a measurement that can constrain what is the either the real formation mechanism. Or what combination of these formation mechanisms are actually responsible for making the problem? Yeah, so multiplicity statistics are predicted for each of these formation mechanisms. So we're measuring them now to see if we can constrain them. Okay, let's thank Adam.